So this one is on academic assessment strategies that we've been thinking about how we can talk a little bit about what we do in our classes. Um, so why don't I let Kristen, why don't I let you go first to talk a little bit about um, how you've utilized oral exams or any other project stuff. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the other things that, that I had on the list. Excellent. Um, so I'm just going to talk about oral exams because there's, a, there's enough with oral exams. And I think that you could probably get an idea um, from what I'll mention here. I put a link in the chat for a Google Doc. And if you want to open it, you can. I'll also share my screen. Uh, here we go. This just has kind of like a list of, you know, the items that I check off during my workflow for oral exams. There's a lot that goes into it on um, the front end, but then there's really no grading involved. So you spend more time getting ready for it, but then you don't spend any time grading essentially. So here's the idea. Um, I plan to meet with each of my students in 20 or 30 minute blocks, depending on you know what all you wanna cover in your exams. I have them sign up for exam slots using the appointment slots feature in Google Calendar, um, which is super, super useful as Kamika already mentioned. There's a link there in case you're not familiar with it. It's actually quite easy to do. Um, and just to show you sort of what it looks like in my calendar, this is my calendar for the week before spring break. Um, I had a pretty hectic Thursday and Friday, but those are the exam slots. And you know the students sign up for them and I can see which students signed up for which exam times. Um, and then the Zoom link is in there, it's in their calendar, they know where to go. Um, super easy to facilitate it that way. So they sign up for exam times. About a week before the exam, I, I give them the problems. Um, they're, they're not easy, they're, they're, di they're different than a typical exam problem would be. A little bit more open-ended, I ask them to explain things. Um, they know that it's not just going to be solving the equation and finding a value for X, for example. Um, but they have a whole week to work on them. You do need to make sure that you're really explicit about what your ground, ground rules are. Like, is it open, open note or not? Um, can they work with each other? Um, you know, things like that. Um, I also give them a lot of problems and tell them they'll only need to solve three problems. So they get to pick the first one. It kind of gets their um, kids, are, hopefully they're prepared for it. So they go into the exam um, sort of, you know, on a, on a good note, regardless of how the other two problems go, hopefully they're strong in the first one. I pick the second two. Um, and then what I do is, um, I, well, I'll show you the Jamboard in just a minute. I also give them the rubric, rubric on the front end so they know what to expect. They know how they're gonna be graded. This is the same rubric I use for my, on, on my oral homework. So they do oral assignments all semester long. Um, it's, so there should be no surprise you know, after the exam as to what their grade is. I feel like the, the rubric is very detailed in that, in that regard. So it's really easy for me to um, assess them in, you know, hopefully an objective way. I feel like it's pretty objective. Um, and then what I do is I give, so I have these Jamboards in the one-on-one -on -one meetings. What I do is I create a Jamboard with one, one board for each of the exam problems. Okay, so there were 11 problems on this exam. The students aren't gonna need to do 11 problems, but this is a template for the exam. And so what I do is um, for each, each student that I meet with, I adjust the sharing settings. So only the student that I'm meeting with has access to this, they have edit access. So if I wanted Kamika to have access, I would give her edit access. And then I don't need to do notify, I can just put the link to the Jamboard in the chat. Um, and then after the meeting, I also remove access. So they can't go in later and like change what they did earlier. After each student's appointment, what I do um, is I'll just save a copy of this. I'll make a copy and I'll change the name of it to like whatever the student's name is. And that's why you see all these, these are from my last exam I just gave before the break. So each one of these is like the same thing, but that student's work. And it's a customized exam because it's only the three problems that they worked on. And it's really easy to make just by copying these uh, Jamboards. Um, let's see. So that's during the exam. Another thing that I do during the exam is I have a spreadsheet open and I usually have it in a different tab so it's not part of my screen share. They, you don't want the students to be able to see this. Um, but each of my students, I, have, I put which problem numbers they have. And I also have a, you know, a column for each of the categories in the rubric. And then I can just type in the numbers as they're, so Theo's doing problem 10 and I'm assessing him as he's doing it. 
I have formulas here that'll add up their scores um, and then compute their overall score for the exam. And then I can also type in notes here. So if you build in enough time during your exam slots, you have maybe five minutes to type up some notes that are individualized for each student. That way, when the exam, when all of the exams are over, it's really easy to, what I can do is I can copy all of this data right here. So I can just control C and then I have a, basically this is a template for a report that I send to each student. So I'll put the student's name here. Maybe, maybe Kamika is the student that I'm picking on and I can just kind of like plop all the scores in there. Oops, oh geez. I did not actually copy the data. Let me see, let's copy that. And, and now I can, I can plop that in there. Oops, I need to do, oh, paste without, no. There it goes, okay. Oh, and I, I forgot to copy that last column. So you can copy all the columns. The students have the data there. And then I can also go in and, you know, put the, I can copy that entry and put it here for the comment. So I don't have to retype it. It's just, you know, keyboard shortcuts with copy and paste, which actually doesn't take much time in the long run. And then as I, as I do one of these for each of the students, I can, I can make a copy of it and share it just with that student. And then I, and I would do notify here. So they get an email that says like, here, here, here's your exam report. You know, let me know if you want to meet one-on-one -on -one and chat about it. Um, but that's kind of the rundown of like the workflow of what I go through for these oral exams. A lot of stuff on the front end, really nothing on the back end. So that's kind of nice. Um, and I, I think I have all of the steps here. Um, if you all want to go back, I know I, I know I just covered that very quickly, but we have a lot to chat about. So I wanted to make sure that I have enough time for questions if you have them. Does anyone have any questions for Kristen now as you're thinking about it? So one question I have for you, Kristen, is so when you give students the, the for the oral part, when they come with, you know, how long do you give them a certain um, amount of time per question? Yeah, so um, I'm still trying to figure out what the right amount of time is. Um, in the last exam, I had 30 minute blocks and I told them to plan for about eight minutes per problem. Okay. And I kind of watched the clock. I had them on 30 minute blocks. So it was easy to know when the eight minutes was up. And I would say like, okay, well, in the interest of time, let's move on to the next one or something. And at the end of it, then I would have five minutes to go through and make sure I did all of my feedback right then and there while it was fresh in my mind. Yeah, otherwise you tend to lose you tend to lose exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And you don't, yeah. and I guess you also don't, you're not telling them like, oh, you're correct kind of thing. Right. When you do it, you just right. sort of, you just sort of listen and, you know, formulate your own ideas, but you don't necessarily tell them that because in, in technically they could also tell students as well, like, right. oh yeah, that's correctly. Cause you know, there are a bunch of them are getting together. Um, they're getting the same, the same problems. So, okay. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. so the other, the other aspect that we brought up, so this is actually, um, a nice, what Kristen just went over is a form of assessment that I think is useful, especially if you're concerned about, you know, the academic integrity part. And so before we went into the session, we had Proctorio come in and it's a proctoring service. And so for me, because I cannot be in a, in a classroom with students, I decided to utilize it. I was a little bit worried to use it in spring because I think this is when we, um, spring of 2020, when they sort of initially launched it and they were telling us about it. And it was a little overwhelming, um, especially since we were converting everything to online, but I did use it in fall and I did use it. Um, I and mean, I'm currently using it right now in spring of 2021. And I do find that it has been helpful in, in um, prom or keeping that academic integrity there. It is not a, foolproof way of saying, well, you know, students can still cheat and that definitely has happened. Um, but I feel like it is a good deterrent. And so depending on the student and depending on what your parameters are, I know Calvin mentioned um, going through and using like the idea, I, the, using your ID and, and verifying. I don't typically do that, but I do lock their screens down. So that way they can only have certain tabs open or that just that tab for that exam open. Um, and then you can have certain parameters. Well, you know, how lenient do you want them to be to go out of full screen mode? I have it pretty stri strict, um, but 15 seconds or so, 30 seconds. 
they'll get a warning and it will tell them, oh, you know, you have now entered, if you do not do anything to correct that, to go back into the exam in the next, you know, 10 seconds, you will be kicked out of the exam. And then they have to go through the process of getting back in. So students realize there's a penalty for going out of it, because if they go out of it, they can look up stuff and then go back in, but their time still keeps ticking away on Moodle. So they can't just do that and Moodle stops their time. It, already, it, keeps, it, it keeps it going. So I found that um, allowing students to, to, if they do get kicked out of the exam for maybe a pop-up comes up, even though they're supposed to get rid of those um, or something else happens with their computer, this semester I am giving them the access to go back in without having to connect to a live agent. So Calvin mentioned about having to you know, utilize some of their, their live agents that you can have, get them back into the exam. And I did that in fall. It was a little bit tricky and a little bit stressful because um, even though I gave students all of the information they needed beforehand, one of the problems I had was that they don't follow through with those instructions. And then when the day exam comes, then it's, they're, they're stressed out. Um, and that happens. And so I try to get them to realize that there's some things they have to make sure they do beforehand. So that way they're not, you know, feeling like they're, they're drowning and they're, they're stressing out because their exam is, time is ticking away. So this semester I'm not doing that and actually it's helped a lot as far as keeping things stream. The flow is good and they just know that they have, you know, 65 minutes, 70 minutes to do the exam and that's what they have. So that's been useful. Um, and so I feel like it's, i I've been a lot, I've, I've done a lot more about setting up Proctorio, but also how I exam, I design my questions on Moodle, um, making them so that they're, you know, like kind of like multiple, multiple choice. And so if students do find a way to cheat in some way or form, that usually there is probably more than one option. And if they're not really looking very clearly, then it kind of will ding them for that. So I found that way as well as short answer questions where they're de definitely critical thinking questions. They're not um, memorization ones and you know just kind of walking through a process. They really have to know the process to answer the question. And I think keeping the time limit is really, really helpful um, on these exams. So that's been my experience and at least in teaching you know, STEM-based comp courses that using Proctorio as a Again, it's a form of assessment, but again, it's a it's a either a quiz or exam. I've used it for both um, for both um, types of assessment. Um, for group projects, I do find that uh, you know, I my upper division classes, I have them work on independent sort of research project, and I have them get, do get together on that. One of the things that I found that has been helpful is doing peer evaluations. So I have them I have them evaluate them each other in the group. Um, the students don't see those evals, but I see them. And so it gives me a sense of how the group dynamic is working. Uh, I feel like most of the time I can kind of head things off and I know what's going on. But when you're online, it's a little harder because you can't see their dynamic in the classroom. So if there's really a problem, some students will reach out to me and let me know. But in general, it's been useful to hear what the students have to say about their, their lab members and also understanding how each lab member contributed to the project. I really wanna know that, like what did they do specifically based off of the guidelines I gave them. So peer evaluations are really helpful for group projects so that way you know um, how to assess their performance at the very end, whether it be through, I usually have them write a proposal, but they also may have to do a presentation and I have them evaluate each other on both. So that's how I sort of use uh, group projects, but more particularly um, evaluations for that for as a form of assessment. Um, and I also use Turnitin for some of my, my major papers that students have to write uh, in order to make sure that they are putting in something that is their own words, their own thought, their own you know, um, way of understanding the material and not someone else's. So I found that that's been useful in giving them parameters as to what they have to consider when they do turnitin.com. And again, that's all linked through Moodle. If they, I don't know how many of you have used that, but um, it is definitely a useful, a useful tool. So I'll sort of stop there um, and open it up. If anybody has any questions for us on how we use any of these strategies, we're more than welcome to, to talk about it. Or if you have something that you've used that you find useful, this would be a great time to talk about it too. Hey, I had a question about Parkturia. 
Sure. Uh, so I tried to use it uh, for my midterm. I installed everything and announced the class and there was some resistance actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one question specifically I have about uh, when um, you're running it, uh, is it any, uh, would it be any uh, notification during the exam to the instructor about suspicious activity or something? Do you get any notification about uh, something is going wrong? No, I don't think so everything would be sum up at the end and you will check at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's like, usually what happens is I, I don't get notified right away. I mean, Calvin may if there's another way that we can, but I don't get notified right away. What happens is once they submit, I know that there's a Proctorio grade book where you can go in and you can look. Um, hmm. I do find that some students they because they know they're being monitored so what will happen is they'll do the exam probably something came up and they realized it and so they will shoot me an email as a as a way of heading it off and say like just let you know that this happened um like a student the other day when i gave the exam i guess she has some pop-ups came up on her screen and one of the neat mm -hmm. things is when you watch the video you can actually see what they're talking about like yeah where and then you can see it come up and you're like oh, okay yeah she did have a pop-up come up um, versus some students, you know, they'll, they'll be like, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden I just got logged out, but really it's because they stopped the proctorio from recording. And there's like yeah. a blue button that tells them not to do that, but they're, but they do do it. So you, you, you start to realize where things kind of went wrong, but you don't typically get a notification, um, mm -hmm. right in there. But usually I get notified if students are having, um, an issue, uh, okay like with the, with the exam. One thing I will say, and maybe Calvin, you can speak to this. Um, I know you mentioned that we don't, that the, the exams or quizzes don't have passwords, but in my last um, exam I gave right before Easter break, um, about three students or so wrote to me telling me that they had, they required them to have a password. Hmm. And I'm not sure why they're getting that prompt because out of what 30 students I have, only like three of them got that. And I don't know what is the reason for that because I told them keep refreshing or go out of the program, go back in, check your settings. Um, but other, other, I'm not sure if there's anything else we can do to kind of prevent that from happening. I don't know if Calvin, if you have any suggestions. Sure, yeah. Uh, the password's typically either a connection error or the student's missing some. Okay. I think we lost you there. Are you there, Kelvin? Uh oh, looks like we kind of lost. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I have you. Another question Thank about you. Proctorio. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with like students wanting to, you know, have written work? Yeah. So they want to write stuff down, and I don't know if that looks suspicious that they're looking down. It, it does, and it depends on how you set up your, your parameters. So I think if, um, so there's a couple ways you can do it. You can use a whiteboard, um, which I know is a little bit trickier, like with math, like you need to be able to write out and yeah. you know, symbols and all of that. One thing you can do is you, you can, you can not necessarily have them track their eyes. So one of the things I do sometimes is I have them track their eyes and you can take that off and technically you could see them maybe writing stuff down um, and then maybe have them, I'm trying to think of if it's best to, if they do do that, you can have them like take a screenshot or a picture of it and then send it to you so you can kind of see what they're working on. That way you know that they're just not writing down whatever, like there is something that shows it in the video that they've actually been looking down and doing that. Um, I, Cause I typically use like the, if, if I have to, I do the whiteboard and, but I'm not doing, like equations and all and all these symbols, but I utilize the calculator or I utilize the whiteboard because I do have students that um, they definitely get stressed because they like to have like scratch paper and write, which I totally get. Um, and I and so I've done the whiteboard as a way to kind of circumvent that. Um, so far, that's been okay. Um, I haven't heard any you know major major complaints. When you do the proctory, you actually can see what they're writing on the whiteboard too. Okay. So you can watch, you can monitor that. You, they have to use a mouse or some kind of digital input though, right? Like a stylus yeah. or something, okay. Yeah, um, in, in theory, typically they're using a mouse because when they're taking the exam, they're taking it on a laptop or desktop. Um, we 
don't, I don't think that Proctor really supports tablets um, to be able to, to do that. No, it doesn't. It has to be on a Mac or a PC. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a little bit trickier with math. And I, and I know that I think the best way to do it is probably have them submit something at the end that shows like, oh, this is my, this is like, like if you had a piece of scratch paper during class, during an actual in-person class, um, I, if I do that with students, I have them give it to me with their exam mm -hmm. and I usually staple it to it. So I have it. So you could probably do something like that where they submit it like on Moodle um, using like, you know, cam scan or, um, yeah. like and then they, that way you can kind of see what they were writing down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions for us? Mm, so maybe if nobody else has a question. So uh, for my midterm, we ended up to have a Zoom recording uh, for the screen and the webcam. And they didn't have any problem with that. But the, about, you know, the proctor, you know, it was like that, they are third party or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, um, have, have you done ever the Zoom recording uh, for monitoring your exam? And can you tell me, I mean, I mean, you prefer Proctorio. Uh, is it something that uh, you can say that Proctorio is uh, better, is doing better uh, in terms of monitoring? Then just uh, we ask them record, they share the screen. The, I mean, I put them in break room, different break room. Everyone shared their screen, uh, start recording on that, and also start recording their uh, webcam. I kind of similar. Yeah, I mean, I found I did Zoom recording mm -hmm. when um, in the spring of 2020. So mm -hmm. when I pivoted to online, I did that, but I did find that it was a lot harder to keep track of like what they're doing. So even though you're watching them take the exam, you kind of also don't know where they're going. Like technically, they should have just the exam open, but I did find that. And I had to, you know, call students on this where they were essentially Googling answers, right? And they would write stuff. And usually by then I already kind of knew some of how they would they be thinking. So I'll look at their answer and I'm like, that's not <laughs> either not their own mind. And I said, secondly, some of that stuff that they bring up, we didn't even go over this in class. <laughs> I already kind of know. And, but again, even though I'm watching them and, you know, you can see that they're looking down but I found that Proctorio limits that because I lock their screens down. And at the end of the day, they can't go into any other tabs. And, you know, you can see if they're on a phone, like you can see if their eyes are diverting to something else. Cause I've also called students on that because they'll see something. And I'm like, there's no reason for you to take your eyes off the, off the screen, but you can see that they go away. They, they move their eyes away. They do something else. And then you can see, you know, maybe 30 seconds goes by and they come back, their eyes, they click a button and they move on. So I know that there's something going on. And I, you know, like I have that all on video so they can kind of see where I'm coming from. Uh, and I feel like it's another way, depending on if you are suspicious of something that they're doing with Proctorio, at least you have a recording that you have as, 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 as document, as evidence that if you're mm -hmm. concerned about them doing something, you can monitor that. You can do Zoom, and I have some colleagues that do Zoom monitoring. During with recording, actually. We do it with recording. recording. I mean, share the screen recording and webcam recording. It kind of, um, I mean, same. But um, I mean, the software, we, we don't have any software that automatically, you know, warn us about uh, any suspicious. We need to go sit and watch the video yeah. and see. Yeah, you know? <laughs> you do. I mean, that's the painstaking part of it. It is, it's a little bit awkward. <laughs> watch students take the exam um but it you know it's something that does it does happen um I that, see. You, know, you have to kind of take that time and you kind of know a little bit depending on the students and and what you know when you look at their exams and what they're doing um but it's good if you're doing the zoom recording you can still do that and have a have that as evidence as well i just found that i i liked proctorio a little better because i could manage um how they're using the device more mm -hmm. so then you can do just watching, you know, recording through Zoom. So I'm I'm more of a, I've, I've become more of an advocate for Proctorio. I wouldn't have said that in fall because <laughs> I had so many issues with it. But at the end of the day, by the final, everything worked out. But I would say in spring, things have been a lot smoother. So I, I'm, now that I know how to use it and I can kind of figure out my settings and I, I kind of know what to do 
in order to make sure that, you know, I'm keeping things as streamlined as I can. Yeah. 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 That's a good question though. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, I don't think, I think if there's no other questions, what we'll do is let's go back to the main session and then we can kind of get things wrapped up. Okay. Thanks everyone. <laughs>